Welcome to episode 96, part 2 of Awesome Astronomy for June 2020. We're not a political podcast, and we have been criticised for being too political in the past. But for us to not use our platform, and for us to say nothing about the recent events that have unfolded in America, and subsequently around the world, would be wrong. Here at Awesome Astronomy, we believe that the universe, and everything in it, belongs to everyone no matter your race, nationality, or gender. However, we know that this is not reality. As stated by the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, Between the lines of the history of science are countless untold stories of people whose work was stolen or sidelined, and people who never got to contribute because they were the wrong colour, the wrong gender, or both. The history of the UK, the US, and many other countries around the world are the same. The future can and must be different. For us to pretend that we here at Awesome Astronomy can fix all the problems would be wrong. We are limited in what we can do. However, there are things we can do, and so can you. We will continue to be honest and continue to listen and learn. We will amplify and highlight and challenge those who fight progression. We encourage you to do the same. In order to promote equality, many lists of material addressing race and racism have been compiled. Astrobytes.org has a great list of these. Go, have a look, pick something, read it, and improve yourself. Goodhousekeeping.com also have a similar list, as does at Victoria Alexander on Twitter, including a list of TV shows and movies. If there's someone you want us to interview, tell us. Help us amplify black voices in STEM. Change starts locally. Let's make astronomy an open and welcome place for all. As you probably gathered by now, I'm Jenny, and I am your host for this month. And joining me are Ralph. Hello. And Paul. Hello there. So, guys, what's going on? Well, weather's a bit crap, isn't it? Yeah, someone bought some bloody astronomy equipment, didn't they? Because it's all gone to sh**. No, I tell you what it was. I tell you what it was. I we bought a new table for our garden, and we bought it right back at Easter. And there was a problem with it, and we've been waiting for the company who made it to get back to us about the fault. And the moment they got back to us after weeks of badgering, and it was sorted, we put the, the table out in the garden. We've used it once, and then it's been crap. So you did so. buy some new equipment, just not astronomy equipment. Not sure on the equipment, no, no. But some some bastard has. Some bastard's bought yeah. a really good scope. We probably also, in the last show, shouldn't have waxed about how great the weather is as well. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know. It's but... actually been cold. <laughs> I'm sitting here in a jumper. Yeah, it? what's that about? It's June and I'm sitting here in a jumper. <laughs> I know, I had to pull a cardi out. I, I've been in my bra and hot pants for the last like <laughs> three months and I'm now sitting here in a jumper. We're back to, like, standard British weather now. Uh, yeah, yeah, completely, completely. I bet you've been on the radio, haven't you? Yeah, uh, back on the BBC radio. Uh, so it was uh, Radio Gloucester and uh, Radio Wales. Uh, well, well, the the Gloucester one was better than the Wales one, I have to be honest. Um, I just honestly felt like the presenter on the Wales one did not give a flying shit about SpaceX. And was just. I've been there, like. Not ev- I understand. Not everyone like is into space and stuff, but yeah, it was it was quite difficult to like get the going, sort of you know going back and forth, mm. which is the sort of thing you've got to have with those interviews. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed the Gloucester one. That was great. Um, we talked about all sorts on that. So the, yeah, that one was quite good. It's really weird how mixed some of the presenters are. I, I did uh, I did a bunch years ago um, for Baker Street. Baker Street Regulars and I, I was on the radio in the morning and the, the TV in the, the afternoon and in the morning the radio oh, it was just terrible they just really could not care less yeah I was standing there trying to you know and it was it was, it was even one of the questions was like so why why should we be bothered by this yeah <laughs> it's like oh god <laughs> oh okay yeah brilliant uh, you've just and I've been sitting listening to them coming on 
And I remember they, they'd been talking about, um, it was like the 10th anniversary of the congestion charge in London. <laughs> Riveting. It was like the least in... Oh, it was like the least interesting. But it, they were like waxing lyrical about the bloody congestion charge. And then suddenly we were talking about the, the closest approach of an asteroid to Earth that you could you could vision, you know, see naked eye. Yeah. Um, and, and they were like, oh, why, why should we be so bothered? And I'm like, okay, we'll go back to talk about the congestion charge if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is funny how things that are truly spectacular really something that it's difficult to get the public enthused about and and Mm. conversely things that are mundane that people will complain about all the time is the stuff that really gets people excited yeah it's weird isn't it it's a weird world we live in you're not kidding (laughs) i saw a tweet uh the other day which was um i feel really sorry for future kids who are going to be studying 2020 in their history classes because it is going to be a big old fat chapter in their history books <laughs> <laughs> oh i don't know i don't know I, I i have a feeling it's going to be like one of those it's going to be like 1933 it's going to be the the kind of the, op- the year the opening couple of pages to a very big chapter <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually yeah it is. It? I mean, we, we have no idea what's going to happen in the next no. 10 years, but we know that this will be the, the, the probably fulcrum of a mm. whole heap of badness that's going to come in the next 20 years. You know, you look at um, Treaty of Versailles and, like you say, 1933 mm. and, and 1927, was it, the Great Depression? But, you know, they're responsible for some of the, or yeah. probably all of the big events of, well, the, uh, of, the, of the 20th century. You so, can imagine. You know, this one. You can imagine how people felt in like the Wall Street crash year, mm. nineteen twenty nine. That was, wasn't it? And you can imagine how big that felt. And at the time, that must have felt like the sort of one of the biggest events and everything that was going on. But you know, with, with hindsight, we can look back and go, "Yeah, but <laughs> there was so much more to come." Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And yeah. you know, it it really is. And 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 things like you know, you look at look at um, like the Munich crisis um, in thirty eight. You know, and, and at the time, people thought, you know, this is it. This is such a depressing year, and they they kind of hopefully turned a corner. And you, you look back at those those records of history of people that people at that mm. time, and you think, you poor sods, you really don't know what's yeah. kind of eighteen months yeah. down the line because <laughs> it gets a lot worse. And you do yeah. you do feel a little bit like that at the moment. It it's just God, what. This is a depressing start to the show, isn't it? I know it really is. Should we try and uh, talk about something a bit happier? Yeah, go for it. Well, Ralph, you got some stuff about Skyrora that you want to mention. Yeah, I mean, this is this is happier in a sense, but then it's um, it's. <laughs> I'm trying not to be negative about this because I don't see this <laughs> quite as exciting as Paul does. I know Paul's <laughs> going to be talking about this later on, but there's been a lot of Twitter conversation about this company, Skyrora. It's a UK company, and it's mm. it, it's exciting because it's the actual first rocket firing test in the UK since the days of the Black Arrow, which. I think was in the 60s was it Paul? It uh it launched in 1970 and 71 from uh we've got to get this pronunciation right we a Woomera. Oh we we had we had it corrected as well didn't we? Woomera w- is w- it? Woomera. W- I can't I can't get it now. Woomera. 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 Yes. Ah. Anyway, the place in Australia that means throwing stick. It's <laughs> 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 where we <laughs> Boomerang. Uh, which is on 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 sort of aboriginal land that we took over. Um yeah, it, it it was the Black Arrow, and it was tested in the Isle of Wight. Um, the engines, well, the, the part of the engines were developed in Buckinghamshire, um, yeah. and then of course the the actual test stand and everything was was down in the Isle of Wight on the Needles Needles battery, yeah. um, and that was it. That was basically the last space rocket kind of designed and tested in the UK. Um, so yeah, um, you're, and, you're and here we are, what forty fifty years on, yeah. and you know we're back to that, which to my mind is kind of like you know makes it sound like a third world country really you know there's uh you know there's so many countries around the world uh, that actually are still developing nations that have gone further than this and launched their own launched their well, own spacecraft and things and and here we are because we've just relied on uh, on other countries which now that we've decided to back away from oh again political again now that we've decided to back away from europe you know we are left to try and try, try and create our own sovereign capabilities again now Partly, but this but is anyway. yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm going to talk about this as a, as a news item later on. But I mean, my my point is that there's there's no point Britain developing a large launch capability that's like anyone else's because there there are there are so many large launch capabilities around the around the world. There are tons of them. Um, it, 
the fact that UK Space Agency bought space on a, an Indian rocket recently. They, you know, why why recreate that? But what there mm. isn't, because all these countries have gone for large launch, because it's it's the big dick thing. You know, swing your big dick because you can build a big <laughs> rocket. Um, the, actually, then this is where. Um, New Zealand has spotted you know, with their electron rocket that there is a small launch capability um, that is available. There is there is a level of launch capability that is generally ignored. That is that between small sounding rockets and you know, putting small payloads into low and sun synchronous orbits are actually what the UK is going to be focusing on, and that that is a useful capability that that is going untapped at the moment and and there's there is room for that in the market there's no point trying to take on spacex or ariane or oh no or, definitely you know, even, not yeah you know, there's no, no point big building big rockets um it, it's pointless people have built them you just buy space on them you know there's loads of companies you can buy space on a, a rocket for, for for big things but in terms of getting the the small um access to space there is there is a huge market for that because actually the the miniaturization of satellites and components things like that means that actually there is lots that can be done with now very very small satellites. Why, you know, wait for space on a bigger rocket, you know, as, as, as an extra bit of cargo, or you know, buy space on a very expensive rocket when we it's possible to build these smaller rockets, um, and that's what you know um, is, is happening in 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 New Zealand. And they're doing very well. And they're building multiple pads now. The, the New Zealand launch site is, is, is building several pads because they've got such a demand for this this size of rocket. Um, and certainly, I'd say we'll talk a bit more about it later on. But Skyroar is just one of of several companies in the UK that are are going after this market. Um, mm. So, but I know you you have no interest in it. So, <laughs> oh no, I've got interest. I just think it's. Uh, <laughs> A little underwhelming. Anyway, uh, to something that <laughs> that you, you you probably see as quite underwhelming, Paul, because it's <laughs> because it's it's now become a, a giant rather than one of these uh, plucky little companies. But uh, SpaceX, who are going to probably dominate this show, I would imagine, um, after returning astronauts to space under their own steam, or rather under their own liquid oxygen and kerosene. Um, (laughs) The the hot topic has not been them going to the International Space Station, of course. It's been about the fancy dress costume appearance of the SpaceX astronauts. Oh, you're Um, ridiculous. And our good friend Andy Burns uh, commented to us about why the uh, NASA and Roscosmos spacesuits look like they're designed to do a job and the SpaceX ones were designed with the practicality of uniforms from Star Trek. (laughs) And he was wondering whether they actually function okay, which, of course, yeah, I mean, they are that kind of amalgam of um, form and function. Oh, it was it was interesting. There was a, a discussion on Twitter with somebody um, who was kind of it was involved in in some of this, and via awesome, and and they were saying that actually the the suits take in um, some of the the Columbia reports uh, recommendations about spacesuits. What the space shuttle Columbia? Yeah. Oh right, and I couldn't see. It. I mean, I had a quick flick through the report, and I and I, I thought it was a bit of the belt and braces thing, because <laughs> Columbia, the, the spacesuits would never have saved them. <laughs> the spaceship broke up. Yeah, it would have needed a little more than a spacesuit yeah. design. But there was stuff about yeah. stuff about vibration on the human body and and keeping the, the neck still and stuff like that. Um, so you know, it's this sort of safety. It, it's the kind of stuff that's done by the seat on Soyuz. So Soyuz has this suit, but it, it fits into a, a molded seat. That, that keeps mm. you kind of in position, because one of the the things people have been pointing out about the the SpaceX suit is that you can't they can't turn the suit they have to turn their entire body they can't turn mm. their heads or their upper body they actually have to turn round, and in a way that doesn't matter because of the kind of where it's supposed to be used but it does seem pretty impractical, but apparently that's yeah. part of the recommendations of this report about how okay. they they should you know this is what you should do. To my mind, that sounds a little bit like why airbags were invented. Because there's no actual need for airbags if you wear seatbelts. Airbags were invented because lots of Americans don't wear seatbelts. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if in the UK, airbags are pretty pointless because 
pretty much universal use of, of seat belts, and most people recognise that. Yeah, I thought it was more to. Is it not more to prevent um, uh, catastrophic whiplash when you know you can yeah, they to won't. prevent your head from moving so much when it's uh, it you know when your body's being restrained and you've still got that forward momentum. It, it's not really going to do much like that. You still you still plow into the airbag. The the it was originally invented because so many people. It probably does something like that now, but I know the original kind of idea was it was built because. So many people didn't wear seatbelts. Mm. Yeah. That, that was kind of usual. That. And to me, that's a little bit of this. It's like it's doing something that, well, if, if anything else is all right, it's not actually required. <laughs> it seems a little mm. bit kind of over the top. But there we are. They look stupid, so it doesn't really matter. But there was also a, a really good interview that NASA conducted on the first attempt um, to launch um, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley to uh, to the International Space Station, the one that was scrubbed, um, and he was talking along with Jim Bridenstine about the evolution of the Falcon capsule and the sorry the the Falcon rocket, the Dragon capsule, mm. and the the spacesuit. And the really interesting thing about this is that yes, Elon Musk really wanted to make it look well. He he said you know he wanted it to look cool, which it's you know it's debatable whether it does look cool or not but he wanted it to be hugely functional he wanted it to take in all the latest technologies so you've got all the advances in material science and 3d printing in fact i think the helmet is uh, mm-hmm. is 3d printed but the thing that really stood out to me was just how quick and functional the spacesuit is in that you know you don't have like in your apollo days you know we used to these big bulky spacesuits that look really cool and you've got your uh, your astronauts in their big bulky suits hmm. carrying their air conditioning unit with them getting in the back of the silver astro van and being carted out to the spacecraft and then being strapped in but in this it was it was quite simply you've got two guys in very lightweight looking suits they get into a car the car drives them to the pad and then they go and sit in these very lightweight seats where they've got the the, the big touchscreen TVs in front of them mm, and mm. it just looked really functional and, and really ergonomic and quick to, to get people ready. I think that they, you know, I, I can't remember how long it took to, to suit up an Apollo astronaut but and, and I know these aren't, you know, the, the, the big bulky spacesuits that that are for walking on the moon but um, but you know, the, the suiting up procedure was just so quick with these. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, Elon is taking a very sort of publicity stance with Mm. Steph right he always wants things to look good he always wants them to be appealing and where everything's a PR exercise yeah exactly Mm. and whereas in the past spacesuits have been designed for functionality in mind you know he he hasn't gone down that road and you know that's why he when I was sort of researching this stuff for the radio um I found that the spacesuits were designed by a Hollywood costume designer and then reverse engineered to make them space worthy Oh really? <laughs> yes. Were they really? So they were. So they were. They were designed by um, Jose Fernandez, and he worked on like Wonder Woman and Wolverine and Captain America and Batman versus Superman. So like all like the superhero films. <laughs> so this is why they sort of look like superhero costumes a little bit, you know, or what you might expect, sort of like alien like races and stuff to wear. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's um. It's the it's the wellies I can't get over. I know, right? This is the thing. <laughs> I think from the knee up, they actually look pretty cool because they're sleek ah. and like I quite like them. But they they are literally wearing wellies. I don't understand. I don't know. Without without having a, a you know, cast, casting assertions on the on the two astronauts, they look like a suit that was designed for the slimmer individual. <laughs> if we're honest. <laughs> I must admit, looking at Bob Benken suiting up, I did think, actually, this is good. This is a nice equal opportunity. Fat guys can go to space too. <laughs> but no, seriously, I... they have been designed to make people look slimmer. So they've got like these dark panels down the side of the yeah, suits, they, which are like made they, to they slim They really you. don't. <laughs> <laughs> they they really don't. I mean, you know, the, the, the Sokol suit is really quite a, a close fit and it rarely makes an astronaut. I mean... I, to be honest, let's face it, a lot of those Russian astronauts, they're not the slimmest, fittest guys. Um, and they wear that Sokol suit and they look absolutely fine. This made them look fat. You know what <laughs> so it is? It Do you know look... what it is? No, no, no. It's the crotch is really low. Yeah. That's what it is. It makes them have like really stumpy legs and then you combine that with wellies. Yeah. They, they look like they look like Daft Punk. They do. After Christmas. They look <laughs> like Christmas. Daft Punks after Christmas. <laughs> it's it's like the New Year's show and they're like Jesus, we've I should be in a French accent, but Jesus, we've you know, like we've we've eaten a lot. 
And well, given that it was designed by a Hollywood costume designer mm. that, that did all of those Marvel things, then, you know, they're lucky there wasn't any leotards or <laughs> assless chaps. <laughs> <laughs> Capes. Capes, yes. Cape. Yes. Cape. Capes. I, I, yeah. I bet Elon thought about that. Yeah. Oh, of course he would have. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. I guess as well because they're not designed for spacewalks, right? They're just designed to keep them alive in the in the capsule, so that yeah, that yeah. slims them down. So they do, you know, they still there's a plug in the thigh, so they still have you know air and life support and power and stuff like that. But um, I imagine any suit that's going to be used for Mars or the Moon, you know, it's going to be heckin' bulky compared to what they're oh yeah, of course it is. they're wearing now. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. anyway. We're starting to get ahead hmm. of ourselves a little bit because obviously, you know, there is no surprise or spoiler that the SpaceX launch is our big story of the month. Um, but we should probably get on and do some of our other little stories before we... Um... After that mammoth introduction, it's goodbye from yeah. Sidonia Base. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we should probably get on with some of the little stories, right? Um, before we, we get into the biggie. So do you want to take us away, Paul? Okay, my news can be summed up as rocket goes boom, rocket goes boom in a good way, and <laughs> Spaceship says goodbye. Um, <laughs> and there you are. Um, so um, actually to stick with the SpaceX, first of all, of course, is first up is SN4 Bites the Dust. Um, in a feat of brilliant publicity timing, oh, good Lord. Not, SpaceX decided to test its SN4 rocket the day before the launch demo too. Um, now, of course, if the weather had held, that test would have happened after the launch demo too. But, of course, alas, the epic failure, <laughs> the one that joins the great hall of spectacular Starship failures, um, happened just hours before the unrelated and very successful demo too. Now, I'm going to pause here because we were recording the part one episode of June when this oh, happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I just I just wanted to play the reaction to us all seeing the footage, which if you haven't seen yet, will convey just how spectacular a kablooey this is. So here we go. Can I just interrupt? Yeah. Starship 4 just blew up. Big styly. This well, Elon Musk said he wasn't going to do it again because he didn't want it to blow up just before he was about to send. To they astronauts. just did a fifth static fire test, literally oh, about fifty minutes up. ago, and the whole thing properly proper kablooey. I'm just looking at the pictures. Oh my God. Everyone's got like I'm massive. It's like blown away half the test stand, and everything. It's like it's. it's Oh, that is dreadful timing a day before <gasps> you've got two people sat oh on. My oh, it's proper. You go, oh, oh, my God. I'm just, seeing the, I'm just seeing the film for the first time. It, I've just oh, found the video. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh that's a proper it's, boom. Is, <laughs> oh, it's great. That is obliteration. That's, <gasps> but it's on Twitter. It's proper bang. Okay, I'm on techcrunch.com, but if you just Google Starship 4... They fire the engine, the tank starts, the tank splits, it starts venting, and then... <gasps> oh, my God. That's great. Oh, f- look at that go. Look at that go. It's not there anymore. It's literally vaporised. Wow. F*** it's in bits. Oh, oh look at that. The, the one I've just retweeted from um, from Awesome. It probably is nothing left of it when it's... when it, When the... Fireball clears, it's gone. Because they're just, they put like a whole load of, uh, I think it was just weight to simulate what it would be like if it had got a nose cone and other stuff on there. Mm. And they perched that on the top. And you can see that whole thing, even though that is pure, it's just something to weigh it down a bit more. You can see it firing up into the air. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Jesus. So there you go. So it's, it's not clear what caused this explosion yet. Uh, this was the fifth engine test of SN4. Actually, it was going very well, and it had passed previous pressure tests and some extreme pressure tests as well. So it all seemed to be going quite well with SN4. But uh, this was a short test this time. And as you just heard from our reaction, with pretty spectacular results. <laughs> so SN5 is already in the build, and the program moves on. As Ralph already mentioned, and we talked about in the beginning, um, we've had the first test of a space rocket in the UK since Black Arrow in the early 1970s. Now, while Ralph is completely underwhelmed by this because he likes his phalluses to be large, girthy, and of great thrust and American... Um, Rather. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am, as you know, a fan of the small, perfectly formed, and understated 
as is my wife. Now, Skyrora <laughs> um, is one of the companies in the UK putting together Britain's new vertical launch capabilities. And here they constructed and tested Skylark L, a rocket on a mobile launch facility in North Scotland in just five days. And that included digging the fire trench as well, which is really cool. Uh, now, Skylark L is a large, it's a single stage to suborbit Kármán line reaching rocket, a sort of beefy sounding rocket to take 60 kilograms of science aloft, prove technology and generate expertise. The name, of course, is carrying on the name of one of the most successful space launch programs in history, the RAE Skylark, which launched 441 times. Pah! The STS looks like a mere amateur school rocket club with its paltry 135 flights. Uh, beyond this, the orbital Skyrora XL, which will be a, a three-stage to sun-synchronous orbit vehicle with a payload of 315 kilograms, and that's what they're working towards. Uh, now, this is a different program to Orbex, which is the other UK rocket startup, which is building um, Prime, a two-stage rocket. Um, different again to the Rocket Lab rocket, which is the kind of New Zealand one, which is coming to Britain as well, which is the Electron rocket. Um, it's also lined up to launch from Scotland and different again from the various horizontal launch endeavours and the work being done on the Sabre engine by Reaction Engines, which is now progressing to prototype stage. So great work from Skyrora with its 30 kilonewton engine. Uh, Tess, it looks like you, you wait 50 years for a British rocket and the whole fleet of them appear at once. <laughs> So last, it's for me, it's goodbye to a quiet workhorse. The last Japanese resupply mission to the ISS arrived on the 20th of May. The last Japanese of this type, um, as astronaut Chris Cassidy grabbed the HTV-9 with the Canadarm and thus ended a very successful series of flights from Japan of the H-2 transfer vehicles, which were built by the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, um, and have launched from Japan's, now I always get this wrong, Tangashima, Kishima, I think it is, isn't it? Tangashima Space Center. Apologies if I got that wrong. Since 2009, atop the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries H2B rocket, which also made its final flight with this mission. Um, now, we don't talk about the Japanese space program nearly enough, which is why I can't pronounce their space center properly. Um, but it is fantastic, and the H2 rockets have been hugely reliable. There's been a whole series of them. H2B was the one basically designed to do this, this HTV stuff. Um, and the HV has been a brilliant workhorse, quietly resupplying the space station since 2009. Both are replaced by the H3 booster and the HTX capsule, but that won't fly for another two years uh, in 2022. And that is me done. Nice. Do you know what? You're right. We don't talk about JAXA enough. No, we don't. They're we... awesome. They're awesome. They quietly... Yeah, they always fly into the radar. They do. They, they, and they have amazing rockets, amazing satellites, all sorts of things. Astronauts, they're being part of the space station. We don't talk about JAXA nearly enough. They're awesome. It's always when it's one of their big missions that they're mm. launching to an asteroid or something because they are quite spectacular. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And and do you know what? They do it on a really small budget as well. It's incredible what they do. It's really, really good. Um, it's very impressive. Go on then, Ralph. Tell us what's occurring. Okay, well, the European Space Agency are really taking the piss with their latest <laughs> recent research showing that urea, <laughs> the main organic compound found in our urine, makes the mixture for lunar concrete more malleable before hardening into a final sturdy shape. <laughs> Why are the European Space Agency playing around with pitting concrete, I hear you ask? Oh my God, I love it. Well, we know that long-lasting future lunar explorers are going to have to dig down under the lunar surface or build solid habitats from the lunar soil to make long-duration habitats to protect them from solar storms and micrometeorites. And it seems... The science community is particularly impressed by the high strength of this new recipe, but it's also something freely available to lunar explorers. The main ingredient is the powdery lunar soil called regolith, and future lunar inhabitants produce 1.5 litres of liquid waste each day. That's brilliant. Now on Earth, uh, yeah, exactly. Now on Earth, urea is already produced on an industrial scale as an industrial fertiliser and used by chemical and medical companies. The idea here, though, is that astronaut urine could be an essential part of building future lunar bases because it's very practical, it's readily available, and it avoids the need to further complicate the sophisticated in-situ water recycling systems in space. Now... ESA tests have even confirmed that this type of concrete mixed with urea was capable of withstanding harsh space conditions such as vacuum and extreme temperatures. 
So the team now want to look at how this new urea-based mortar could help protect future astronauts from harmful levels of radiation. Who said yes to this? I I know, right? And how many times did this idea have to get pitched before someone said yes? I mean, it turns out to be brilliant. But this is is not something that someone's going to go, I've got this idea, here it is, yes, go and do it. I'd fund that straight away. If someone came in and said, I can make concrete out of piss, I'd be like, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Turn shit into gold. Go for it. <laughs> <Is> it? <laughs> yeah. And just to add to, uh, to Paul's news stories about British rocketry, and I think this is still British rocketry because it's owned by Richard Branson, who's British, and it's part of Virgin, although Virgin's such a conglomeration now, you never know where, where in the world um, different parts of it are from. But... One of the less showy ways of getting small and medium-sized payloads in space is using modified small intercontinental ballistic missiles launched from aircraft. Um, So since the 1990s, um, the US company Orbital ATK have launched their Pegasus rocket from a Lockheed TriStar aircraft almost 50 times, um, 44 times between Mm. 1990 and 2016. And in fact, you know, things like, uh, I think it's the... Uh, New Star, one of the X-ray telescopes, um, yeah, yeah. Um, a science instrument that was launched by that too, and 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 while these Pegasus rockets can launch up to uh, 440 kilograms to a low Earth orbit for 40 million dollars, Virgin Orbit have now entered the game with their latest test flight using a Virgin 747 and their Launcher One rocket, which can loft half the weight but for a quarter of the cost. Mm. And but unfortunately, Virgin Orbit failed in their first full mm. dress rehearsal over the bank holiday weekend recently. Um, they sent the 747 to 35,000 feet before firing the launcher one towards orbit, but aborting the rocket before it got into space. So while they already have a, a range of customers, including NASA to the US Department of Defense, lined up to help them reach their target of offering 24 rockets a year, They've still yet got to get their first successful launch before they can join the small sat launch game currently emerging with SpaceX and Rocket Lab, and now perhaps also Skyrora. Um, but Virgin Orbit also plan to send a suite of Polish CubeSats to Mars in 2023, which would make it the first commercial mission to the Red Planet, and at a fraction of alternative uh, spaceflight costs. But, as we say, still got to get past these prototyping hurdles. But in a nice gentle swipe towards SpaceX and Starlink, the company said, should we defy the historical odds and become one of those exceedingly rare teams to complete a mission on first attempt, we'll deploy a test payload into an orbit, take our data, and then quickly deorbit so as not to clutter the heavens. Ooh, no. burn! <laughs> they didn't succeed, and SpaceX get the last laugh. Mm. Also, 24 rockets a year... That's a lot. It's twice a month. It right? is. Yeah. It is. It is. Although SpaceX are launching up to 38 times this year. Oh, don't I know. Keeps popping up. Ooh, another lot of Starlink. Another lot of Starlink. Mm. Yeah. Just- yeah. Which props up Paul's argument that there is a big market for these small yeah. and medium sized satellites. I'm, I'm not sure the market is that big or that it's it's going to be long lived, but um, it'll be an interesting one to see uh, who's right on this one. Yeah, we had, a, we had a good little discussion about this, didn't we? And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, and we, we sit each side of the fence. Yeah. Um, so my final news story is around the lander designs chosen for Artemis um, because we we only touched on this in the last show. And this is big because this is one of the key components, perhaps the final absolutely critical components to the Artemis program to get people onto the moon in 2024 that still needs development because unlike Apollo, when we had one lunar excursion module or LEM, This time around, when NASA have been given less money and a tighter moon landing deadline, they're going not just for one, but all out with three very different designs. Oh, they're sort of hedging their bets, I guess. Yeah, I I think that's part of the case. I mean, NASA went with three designs initially, I believe, but then um, very quickly just decided on one. But I think that the difference here is that commercial space flight is now a thing, and... And rather than having to go with one of the expensive defence giants like Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin, they can now go for other companies to to develop things at a fraction of the cost. And we have Blue Origin getting $579 to develop a three-stage lander using their new Glenn rocket system. 
and United Launch Alliance's Vulcan launch system. This is the design that's most like the Apollo lunar lander with a propulsion mm. stage for ferrying to and from the lunar gateway in orbit around the moon. And it's expected to have an uncrewed lunar landing test in 2023. So also like Apollo, the descent stage becomes a single-use piece of lunar garbage once it's landed mm. and, and the ascent stage takes off from there. The second company developing a lunar lander is Dynetics, which is led by Sierra Nevada Corporation. Uh, they are the, what's the name of the little shuttle pole? Dreamliner, is it? Yeah, no, uh, 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 um, Dream Chaser. Dream Chaser, yes. Yeah. Um, so they're getting 253 million and they'll also use the United Launch Alliance Vulcan launch system. And this is essentially a, a long rectangular cradle with rocket engines at either end and a habitation module in the middle, which has the advantage of the habitation module being much lower to the ground than the other designs with virtually no ladder. Ooh. And it's also entirely reusable. Oh. And lastly, of course, we have SpaceX who get 135 million to develop Starship using their super heavy rocket. So this will be a huge rocket that lands on small legs in an upright position, kind of like your old sci-fi rockets. Mm -hmm. It'll be configured to be fitted out with habitation and cargo transport space using a crane elevator to get people and a lot of cargo from the high up storage bays down to the lunar surface. Mm. This is also fully reusable and means that Musk's crazy Starship development timeline can continue apace now he's secured more NASA funding for it. Ooh, that, that's, um, that's a heckin' lot of technology that they've got to rely on to get people up and down and stuff. And, and yeah, I, have, I think the SpaceX one's actually the riskiest because yeah. you need everything to be functioning and it's huge and, you know, we can see they, they crumple quite quite readily. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, I think, the the least practical one. I mean, yeah, this whole lift thing. It looks cool. It looks cool, mm. but there is a real element of style over substance there. The whole cranes high up bays and things, you know, lowering stuff down and everything on this this big tall thing. That's a bit. It, it, it's but the options are great, and yeah. these these can work independent. Well, not all work independently, but mm. they give options for different kind of commercial opportunities even if they're not chosen mm. for, for NASA it's mm. interesting as well that SpaceX again have got the least amount of money they always seem to get the least amount of money from NASA and yet so far but, but <laughs> they succeed in every round of funding yeah. though so I think cumulatively I wonder how much they actually yeah. get yeah this is true yeah. small bits but frequent which is always slightly one in the eye for everyone who, who claims that it, it's private business that is, is really succeeding in space and doing well they're not, not inside they're doing it on the back of no. taxpayer money <laughs> just yeah, yeah, yeah. Just... and expertise as well i mean yeah, yeah. the amount of the amount of information and and help that, that all of these companies have had from nasa from the experience that they've had over 40 years in or more than 40 years in in space flight mm. um that the transfer of knowledge is uh, is phenomenal as well with the other companies don't don't get a look in at yeah so I mean, we're talking about SpaceX, so we may as well go on and do the big news story, right? Oh, what could that be? The big news story is, of course, the um, you know first American launch of American astronauts from American soil to the International Space Station um, since the, the shuttle missions all ended nine years ago. Um, I'm sure that everyone listening watched it. I did. Did you guys? Yeah. I'm sure you did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course you did. Who didn't? Um, yeah, so this is, you know, it, it is a big leap. We talked about it at the beginning of the show, and it is this kind of paradigm shift now from, you know, governments building and designing and running their rockets to, you know, outsourcing them to private companies, just like, you know, you do with anything. You know, you you buy a cup of coffee, you know, you don't make the coffee, you get someone to do it for you, and it's just this time they're getting you know, someone to make the rockets for them instead of it being mm -hmm. a cup of coffee. Um, I guess let's do a bit of a chronological order thing, right? So should we talk about why it was scrubbed? Because it was originally supposed to launch on a Wednesday, um, but the mission got scrubbed really kind of at the last second. Um, and then it was rescheduled and it successfully launched on the Saturday. So the reason it got scrubbed because, you know, people, I, there was some people that I was talking to, they were like, oh, well, it's, you know, it's reasonably clear skies. Like, why aren't they launching? And um, 
they did this because they were worried about triggering a lightning strike. Um, there was a lot of electrical charge in the atmosphere. And um, I guess, I mean, people have said, well, you know, <laughs> the Soyuz, they get hit by lightning saying, all the time. It wouldn't, have, like... it wouldn't have bothered Roscosmos. They'd have just fired that Soyuz exactly on time. Yeah. <laughs> But I think, you know, the first launch, they probably want to be like, uh, we, do we want to risk it? Mm, no. So, I mean, it got cancelled when it did because uh, with SpaceX, it's a little bit different because their fuels are um, rocket-grade kerosene and mm. liquid oxygen. As soon as that liquid oxygen is loaded, you've got a really finite window in which you've got to launch this rocket because um, if you leave it sat on the pad too long, this liquid oxygen is going to start to kind of boil away. It's going to start to heat up. And then that changes, you know, how long they can burn their fuel for, what their range is, um, how efficiently they're burning and stuff like that. Um, mm. Which is why, although, you know, there's this thing now, oh, if they'd waited 10 more minutes, they could have launched. Um, but they couldn't because they would have had this fuel issue. And of course, it's not just that. You've got um, getting the rendezvous with the International Space Station is complicated, um, surprisingly, because, you know, it, it's space. But... Um, so the International Space Station orbits the Earth at an angle of about 52 degrees um, compared to the equator. And when you launch from Kennedy, you end up orbiting at an angle of about 28 degrees. So you've got these, you know, overlapping mm, paths. Mm. And the ISS takes about 90 minutes to orbit the Earth one, two. So everything's moving very quickly. You've got these overlapping paths at different angles. So it's... Um, it's all about, you know, very finessed timing. And the thing with, like, cargo launches is you can have the cargo kind of take a long time to get up to the International Space Station. It doesn't matter. That cargo will sit there for two, three days, you know, just orbiting the Earth, and it's fine. Obviously, when you've got people on board, you want them to sit in their, you know, very small capsule for the shortest amount of time possible, which is 19 hours. So this also limits when they can launch um, as well so that they can minimise this catch-up time. Mm. That, um, that's from America because the shortest catch-up time, I think, if I'm right, from Kazakhstan is about six or seven hours. Yes, yeah, it's because mm. it's at such a like lower latitude. Yeah, I, I love I love the fact so. that the, the Russians just they, in Kazakhstan they've got the best. They, they're in a desert. The weather's yeah. almost perfect all the time, and it's it's better for sort of some of these things. Kazakhstan's such a great launch site. Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. And of course, like you know, catching up is not straightforward in space because you know you're moving in three D, right? Mm. It's not like you're traveling along a road. So you have this thing where you know, okay, I need to speed up. So you fire the engines, and that's great. You actually speed up, but then you also move up as well in you know the sort of z direction which you don't do if you speed up on a road so mm. it is it's a very strange game of cat and mouse to sort of catch these capsules up to the iss and i guess the final reason as well is why they were so kind of obsessed with the weather um with the the launch is that the crew dragon capsule like the abort system can be fired basically right up until the point where they get into space yes Yes. Um, and that means that there is a huge patch of the earth which they could land on so you know they aim to land you know, land them in the sea it's the safest way to land them and it's basically the entire Atlantic Ocean which is their, their sort of target area for landing depending on when this abort system is triggered um, they even had crews on standby in Ireland in case they landed in the Irish Sea. That's right, yeah. The, so the, that... the Irish Navy and the uh, the, the Irish uh, Coast Guard were on standby to pick them up. Yeah, just in case. And that means you know, there's a huge swathe of the ocean where they have to make sure that the weather is okay in most of it so that if something does go wrong and the abort is triggered, then wherever they land, it's going to be fine. Someone can go and get them. Mm. Um, and so those three things combined, really... Is, is what makes you know it so tricky to launch SpaceX, I think. Like, everything has to be just right. And unfortunately, it wasn't, because there was a bunch of storms yeah. in the Atlantic. It's going to make some interesting decisions in the future, cause especially when they launch in, so like, the autumn and winter. Um, if, if that's still yeah. going to be the case, that they, they want this sort of, you know, quite perfect weather across the Atlantic, well, from about October, that never happens. <laughs> It's you know, go, yeah. going towards the coast of the UK and, and Ireland and, and France things where the, where this you know would splash down area would be. I, it's pretty much a, a roller coaster from sort of October. Yeah, I think it was the start of hurricane season last week. Yeah, 
I, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? If if that if they're going to have that kind of level of of sort of safety check, and that that's got to be the the kind of threshold, they ain't going yeah. to be launching for half the year. Yeah. <laughs> so, I am sure that Windows will change. Mm, mm. I mean, they'll have to. I mean, they can't, you know, surely they're not going to abort launches sort of five, six, seven times. Yeah. It won't look good. Should have gone with Dream Chase, so it's got wings. <laughs> and it's such a huge deal. I mean, you know, you've got the first Americans from American soil um, whole thing, which is kind of the big tagline. But what it really is, is it was really the final kind of test flight which for SpaceX, and it kind of seals them now um, into NASA's commercial crew program. Um, they're going to get you know certified now f- as being the people that are going to carry the astronauts back and forth for the um, for America to the International Space Station. I mean, you know, it is a huge leap, and it is a huge shift in the way things are done. So you know, demo. It's called demo two. This mission that's just happened because. Um, Demo 1 was basically a dry run where they did everything that they sort of did on Demo 2, but they um, shoved a dummy into the capsule wearing the spacesuit and everything um, and launched that up to the space station. But, you know, it's not it's not the first time that the capsule has been launched to the space station. It's been used to resupply the ISS, um, you know, like 20 times, right, with the mm. cargo version of the Dragon capsule. So it's, you know, although it's a huge leap, it was very much the next natural step for SpaceX, right? It wasn't some huge, complicated... I mean, okay, that's wrong. It was huge and complicated, but it wasn't some kind of giant leap. It was just the next natural step. Um, yeah, I think I think the big leap is that they're the first company to be able to get over the safety hurdles and to, to develop yeah. um, a capability to get Americans natively onto, onto the ISS without having to rely on you know, international partners. Mm. Yeah, exactly. It is that tagline of Americans launching Americans on American soil. Yeah. Can I can I be honest? America. Can I be honest? Yeah, go for it. I wasn't that excited. Oh, mm. I know you weren't. You were a mm. massive buzzkill. I asked it didn't have a big Union Jack on the it side did. and a moustache <laughs> painted on it. <laughs> no, I think I, I. What did I say? Brilliant. We've we've finally got back to Gemini in 1965. We are able to launch. Do you realise the hypocrisy of getting excited by a static rocket fire <laughs> test on a small rocket engine? Yeah, but do you know how and many? Not being impressed by this. Yeah, but do you know how many people Skyora actually uh, uh, employ? Like five people. I think you could hear some of the tongue in cheek in my news report on that. But um, <laughs> it, it, there was a little bit of me going, "Yeah, but this is just two astronauts." To low Earth orbit in a splashdown capsule. It's literally like a high tech Gemini. Did you see the booster landing though? Yeah, oh, that was cool. My so God, cool. does that come down fast? That looks like it's a crash all the way to the last second. I said it didn't because the video feed cut out. It always does. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. Musk likes doing that a bit, doesn't he? He goes a little bit Chinese state media yeah, sometimes. Just in case <laughs> it crashes. I don't want anyone seeing that. Um, <laughs> but there it, it was a little bit of me. I was like, oh, this is really cool. It's, you know, we're back, you know, NASA back in the game and all that. And then there was a little bit of going, yeah, but the last time they launched, it was with a shuttle with, it could carry up to seven people and, and the whole massive cargo section and it had wings and lands on a runway and, and, and was reusable. And and here's a capsule that, like, can take four people. If they put that two of them. had a Union Jack painted on the side, you would be <laughs> struggling to keep your head above water yes, with but, all the jizz surrounding you we, right now. But, <laughs> but but we'd never we would never have done that before. So it would have been exciting. I still think it's exciting. In the same way when India, for instance, finally does its its first crewed flight, I'll be really excited because that would be really cool. You know that would be mm. really cool because and yeah. you know they, it's all on the cards. They're, they're building it. It's going to happen. That's going to be amazing. No, the really cool thing about this is that it means that I mean we're talking fractions. Of, I think it's about a little bit less than the cost of a soy, one seat on the yes. Soyuz. You'll yeah, be able yeah. to launch four people because this will have this will have another two people that can fly in it, which means that the maintenance of the um, of the International Space Station yes. can be yeah. left to the commercial sector now. Meaning that mo- that NASA can pump more money into going beyond low Earth orbit. So, you know, they can go, right, okay, uh, low Earth orbit, sorted. Now we can concentrate on going further out. I, and that's and what we all want to see, it's also saved NASA, right? 
billions. They reckon it saves oh, God, NASA yeah. oh, yeah. up to 24 billion by hand in control of, you know, sending um, astronauts to the International Space I Station did... over to commercial companies. But I did, I did, I mean, uh, all that I get and it's mm. brilliant and I love all that side of it. And it, I think it's, it's on, a, on a bigger kind of overlook of the whole space program. I think it's awesome and it's amazing. But as a mission in itself, I got... I struggled to be excited by what was basically like watching any other Soyuz launch of three astronauts, which think... frankly is usually very dull. But, but it's like you said, it's a big patriotism exercise. And, you know, if you're not um, American, but, you're not going to get the value. Yeah, of, but you know, you know what? what it, was, it was an element to be kind of a bit naughty. They did big it up a lot, didn't they? And I think, I mean, and I, I have understand. a feeling there was a, there was a, a bit of a band-aid moment about the whole launch America because we need something really big and to try and bring everything together and 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 say that everything's okay and I think well the, the well NASA all because they spend so much taxpayer money mm. they have to they, yeah. they've got to try and justify it somehow and get people excited about it it's the same as us you know whenever you know whenever Trident comes up oh, for yeah, yeah. or whenever uh, whenever we do anything that, that requires a lot of taxpayer money, we have to really, really over-egg the value of, mm. of either the replacement or, or the expense that, that's going into it. No, this is true. And it's no different this is true. for space endeavours, except that it's in a more perilous position because there's a lot of people that just go, why the hell have we even got a space mm-hmm. agency? It's mm-hmm. really expensive. I think also it's not necessarily what that specific mission was that's the most exciting thing. I think it's like what it represents... And that it represents this shift, you know, to commercial companies rather than governments doing it. And, um, you know, this it, it's kind of the first step in the door for really opening up space to everyone. You know, because like, they've talked about how the... I mean, it's well beyond the reach of most people now. But the you can buy seats, you know, on SpaceX rockets to go up into space. And they're like 20 million at the minute. And you know this. This is how it begins, and oh, of course, how you know eventually you'll see it. You know, fifty years down the road, people will be nipping into space for a little jolly, just like people nip over to Benidorm. I think it's going to be quite a while before that happens. But I said, yeah. fifty years. I think it, and not like five. Yeah, I, I no, I I I was fascinated by it. And I watched it and I thought it was brilliant. And you know, on that scale, but actually, as a mission, I did think actually it was quite dull. It was nice, though. It was. I think because, like, it, 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 I don't know. I was kind of the end of the shuttle era, right? Whereas I've been able to watch this yeah, yeah. sort of develop over the past, and I think maybe that's what a lot of the excitement is about. We're sort of people of my generation. We're sort of of the age where we could kind of watch it really grow and develop and follow the journey mm-hmm, all the way through. Because mm-hmm. we were kind of like when we were young, you know, okay, the space shuttle was a thing that just existed, so it was just kind of in the background of our minds, but we didn't really think about it too much. Whereas this is something that we've sort of seen, you know, being developed. We've seen the successes, we've seen the failures, and now suddenly, oh, SpaceX are doing this thing. This is awesome. So I wonder if maybe that's where a lot of the sort of hurrah about it comes from as well. And also, if you take a look on the Cushioner back channel at the picture I've just sent you, it looks just like the ghosts in Pac-Man. Oh, yes, I've seen that. That's really cool. I'm having a look. look. (laughs) And who wouldn't want that? Oh, yeah. (laughs) It does. It does. It also looks from a distance. It really does look like a penis. It looks like a... Because you've got those little... It... And who doesn't want to see a giant <laughs> penis thrusting into the sky with a big old American flag it on it? It does look like a massive vibrator. It really is. It's yeah. got these little things that stick <laughs> yeah. out on the side at the top, like, from certain angles. It's ribbed for your pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, frankly, especially when, it, when the, the first stage comes off, the second stage in the capsule, it looks like a sex toy. <laughs> I mean, would we expect yeah. anything else from Elon? No. We've got superhero suits, a penis rocket, like, it all fits, right? Yeah, yeah. It was meant to be. Mm. And if anyone's wondering what they're doing now that they're up there, because this is the problem, like, the launch happened and suddenly the coverage has stopped, right? (laughs) You know, they (laughs) followed it until (laughs) they... Because it's just two more guys on the ISS. It's not that interesting. (laughs) Yeah. But if anyone is wondering... 
because some people might be wondering um they're basically going to you know they're going to help with all of the science experiments that are happening on the space station right now but then they're also their main sort of prerogative is to examine how well the dragon capsule survives the journey up to the iss um you know evaluate its performance um stuff like that so make sure that it can of... can keep the power and, mm. and transfer yeah. power from the ISS, you know, so it can be that ferry that, that docks to the space station, stays there and then brings people back again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is why they don't know how long um, Bob and Doug are going to be up there for. Um, it could be a month. It could be four months. So four months is kind of the maximum duration mm. that the um, current Dragon capsule is designed to last mm. for in space, because after that, the... Um, the solar panels start suffering too much damage um, from just the harsh environment that is space. So um, if the if the dragon capsule comes back down after a month, that means, her huh, it was a bitch. We need to work <laughs> on it. But if it stays up there for three or four months, then it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to change the subject a little bit, but not really. Um, so I'm shoving a bonus question here at the end of the news uh, because I'm hosting and so I'm allowed to do shit like this when I host um, <laughs> and this comes from Alex Bell who's at the BLT um, on Twitter and he says hi AA team I'm eagerly anticipating your next episode lockdown is getting boring isn't it just but we still have to keep going I love it I love it <sighs> I love it too I love it I love getting... the thing is so I'm like hardcore isolating I have not left my house or my garden since the 18th of March. Other Bless. Than... Yeah. Oh, uh, no. Uh, do you know what? Neither have I, really. If I could bunker myself into my cellar, I would no. do. I've got as much wine as I want down there. I'm happy. Well, that's because your middle name's Fritzel. <laughs> the thing is, it's probably fine for you guys, right? You have your own houses and everything, and I I live in a house share. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And true. it's Getting difficult. That. That's it's true. difficult. I, I feel Being like old if... is great, Jen. You'll love it when you oh. get old. You, I, I, I cannot wait. I'm I'm not special isolating or anything. I've barely been out. I've I've really not gone anywhere. I've because why would you? Yeah. Great. Yeah, but you all, you have a lovely big garden and like when I say we have a garden. Oh yeah, you've got deer in your garden, Paul. I, I, when I say we have a garden, I'm not joking. Ours is so ours is in the shape of a triangle, right? So if you imagine a square that's about 10 foot by 10 foot and then like a little triangle on the top of it, that is about the size of our garden. It's not large. You have a garden shaped like the constellation Cepheus. How astronomy is that? Man. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we do. But um, I'm getting quite fed up and frustrated. Um, but I understand, you know, I know how important lockdown is and, you know, everyone has to keep doing it. And I completely understand that. But I am also allowed to feel frustrated. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm allowed to feel these feelings. But anyway, we weren't talking about lockdown. We were talking about... <laughs> SpaceX and and moon stuff and it was a nice segue to this question from Alex which we've kind of ruined but I'm going to get back to it so Alex says I thought of a question for the show and that's all we have for this show so it's goodbye from Cydonia Base <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he says there's been much excitement this week as everyone looks skyward to see the ISS and Bob and Doug speeding towards them in the Dragon module well everyone's excited except for Paul who think it's lame uh, everyone's excited <laughs> because human exploration space has been so crap for the last 30 years that this is like the most exciting thing that's happened and it just demonstrates how it looks like a giant phallus get excited it like a Paul penis. <laughs> and it's Gemini and anyway carry on <laughs> Even my wife tore herself away from Netflix to take a look, and now we know exactly why she did that, Alex. Because <laughs> she finished watching Tiger King and there's nothing else to watch. Well, no, I was thinking the fact that the, the rocket looks like a penis, but apparently that joke <laughs> didn't translate. Now, thinking about the next stage of human exploration and the lunar gateway, will it be visible from Earth? In the future, will we be seeing amateur images of the lunar gateway transiting the lunar disk or as a tiny bright object orbiting the moon? Uh, and that was from Alex. And he, he finishes off this question saying, currently dealing with my third infestation 
a bumblebee nest following a wasp a wasp's nest last year and an astronomy curious rat uh well they say bad things come in threes right so i i think you're you're good now for a little while well this is rolling on this is the fourth thing because it started off with a pandemic i believe oh mm. uh, yeah this is true <laughs> <laughs> yeah a pandemic in your observatory <laughs> So, who right. wants to take this? I, I'll take this. So, right, right the, the, the answer is almost certainly no. No. Oh. Soz. And, the, uh, I'm sorry. So, this is all to do with the resolving power of your telescope, which is known as the Dawes limit, after the Reverend Thomas Dawes, who came up with the formula. Uh, this defines the smallest or finest detail possible with the scope you have. It's actually pretty simple. If you work in Brexit, I mean inches, then you take <laughs> the aperture of your scope and divide it by 4.56. Okay, um, and if you're a sensible modern type who actually likes science, then you'll take the scope aperture in centimetres and divide by 11.6, or in millimetres and divide by 116. The number you get is the resolving power in arc seconds. Now, with a bit of trig, I'd suggest a tangent rule, as you you know the angle and the, dis- the ad distance, which is the adjacent, if you know your triangles. Um, you can apply that result to what area it is you're looking at. So, for instance, your typical 127mm 5-inch scope will have an R of about 0.9 arc seconds, and this means that on the Moon it will resolve a crater about 1.7 kilometres across. Okay. Caveat, with perfect seeing. We, exactly, I should add, yeah, with absolute perfect conditions. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Work that up to a 250mm or 10-inch scope, then you have an R of 0.5 arc seconds, which translates in perfect conditions as an 800 meter crater on the moon. Yeah, you're seeing where this is going. If you consider a 500mm <laughs> scope, that's 20 inches, baby, um, you can resolve a 400 meter crater on the moon, and then, while we don't know the exact dimensions of the gateway yet, it's a lot smaller than the ISS, which is 109 metres long. And you realise mm. that you, you couldn't even resolve the ISS at the moon with a 500mm yeah. scope. Um, this is not something you're going to be able to see. So I guess the gateway is about 20 metres long, looking at it roughly, I think along its longest dimension. You'll need a scope with an R in this scenario of 0.01, which works out as a scope with a 10,000mm aperture. So if you have the keck in your back garden, you're good to go. Um, I think that ISS point's a really good one there because the ISS, to, to to make it a little bit more prosaic, the ISS is the same distance above your head when it's directly overhead as London is from Middlesbrough. Yeah. So it's not really that impressive and it's not really that bright. You know, it's it's probably about as bright as Jupiter at its brightest. Yeah, exactly. And that's 250 miles away, whereas the moon is, what, 238,000 miles away yeah, on, exactly. uh, on average? Yeah, and, and exactly. That- that would be where just right at the beginning I said almost certainly no my only caveat is not knowing how big and how reflective the final solar array is going to be on gateway but even if they're mirrors which they won't be you know at that kind of distance yeah. the the brightness is going to diminish so a much a very and- very big scope really big scope might just have a chance I would have thought at some occasions if the, the solar ray is big enough and reflective enough to catch a little glint of light mm. yeah. possibly and that's the only little caveat I put in there because I was thinking about this and I thought yeah do you know what There's if it's got a big enough solar array because I don't think they finalised that yet it might just in the right angle the right moment you get a little glint especially if it's coming over like the yeah. Terminator or something like that you know over that, that kind of line but that, and it is I, going to need big solar panels because yeah. they're testing out solar electric propulsion yeah, with it as well. Exactly. So, so it is going to need to, to draw a lot of solar but power. But I'm going to say probably not. I doubt it. Yeah. I very much but you doubt will get, it. I think you will get pictures taken from professional telescopes, which will have to be the biggest professional, professional telescopes. telescopes and that will yeah. be interesting to see what they can resolve. Yeah, exactly. And it might only just be a pixel or two. Um be nice to think you could get... You know, resolution images like amateurs can get yeah. at the ISS uh, if they're using professional telescopes, but I still doubt it. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at something like you know, as as a, a small airliner, you know, at best, a small a small little yeah. regional airliner in orbit around the moon, and you're trying to see it with a scope. You ain't going to see it. It's just too small. No. There we go. <sighs> Sorry. And there we are. Uh, 
And so it is time for that special section of the show, the electromagnetic spectrum, where we're exploring all the different wavelengths um, in part one and what we can see at these different wavelengths. And then in part two, we're kind of looking at the telescopes and the instruments, things like that. So this time on our tour of the electromagnetic spectrum, we're talking all things associated with near and mid infrared. Now, a great thing about the near and mid infrared is that up until wavelengths of about 10 microns, there are what we call atmospheric windows. And that is the atmosphere allows light at certain wavelengths in this range to pass through and reach the ground. This means that we don't have to go into space to do effective astronomy in the near and mid infrared. Now, of course, it still usually means a telescope placed above much of the Earth's atmosphere on top of a mountain somewhere, because the more atmosphere and water vapour you can get above with infrared astronomy, the better, because water vapour is very effective at absorbing infrared light. As with any telescope and detecting system that's measuring heat, sticking it up in space is still the ideal option. It gives you access to light unimpeded by the atmosphere, and the environment is much more stable in terms of temperature control. But this is expensive, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of development time. So having the ground-based option really makes astronomy at these wavelengths a lot more accessible. Near and mid infrared telescopes typically more like traditional optical telescopes. And actually, it's usually pretty easy to adapt an optical telescope to work at near infrared wavelengths. You just need a different instrument that can detect light at the correct wavelengths. And a great example of this is the Hubble Space Telescope. Although it's always described as an optical telescope, um, HST can actually detect near-infrared light as well. Near and mid-infrared instruments are usually called, just like their far-infrared submillimeter counterparts. And although we are looking at warmer things at these wavelengths, we still need to cool down the instruments so that the objects we detect are not lost in the heat of the detectors themselves. These days, near and mid-infrared detectors work more like CCD chips than the barometers that we talked about for the far-infrared. A photon comes in and is absorbed by some special semiconducting material. Now, semiconducting material sort of does what it says on the tin. Sometimes it's conductive, sometimes it's not. This means it's a great material for detectors because we can choose materials that become conductive when they get a certain amount of energy. And for our purposes, this is when photons of the right wavelength hit the detectors, providing that right amount of energy. The energy provided by the photon causes an electron to get excited and jump up to a higher energy level. And then suddenly we've got an electrical count, which we can then measure and use to build up a picture. A near and mid infrared telescope that everyone's probably heard of by now is, of course, the infamous James Webb Space Telescope, or JUICED, as uh, we like to call it. You know the one, 18 hexagonal mirrors which, when combined, make a 6.5 metre diameter mirror compared to Hubble's, you know, puny 2.4 metres. And that five layer sun shield, right, which is going to cool the telescope mirrors down to about minus 200 degrees Celsius, or roughly the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Still not ringing any bells? It's that one that was supposed to launch, like, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. It's probably going to launch, well, slated for next year, probably won't be till the year after. You know the one by now. Now, because JWST is a dedicated infrared telescope, its mirrors are actually coated with gold, as opposed to the aluminium which is usually used on optical telescopes. And this is because gold is more reflective at infrared wavelengths. And when it eventually launches, whenever that may be, JWST will use these semiconducting detectors that we just talked about to stare at the earliest galaxies. And their light is so red that they are invisible to Hubble. It's going to be really, really exciting times. So there you have it. Near and mid infrared astronomy is more like optical astronomy these days. You can do it effectively from the ground at certain wavelengths. We can use detectors that are basically souped up CCDs and gold is the way to go when it comes to mirrors. And so on that note, it's time to finish. Thanks again for tuning in and listening to us ramble on about our sheer love of space. And if there's anyone else you like to listen to while they wax lyrical about the great unknown, then one, uh, quite frankly, screw you for your betrayal. Uh, you're now top of the invasion list. Um, even I have to agree with the Martians on that one. Um, but number two, tell us who they are. So maybe we can set up an interview or some kind of collaboration. And 
definitely not so we can add them to the invasion list. Uh -huh. And as always, if you want to steer the show by sharing your thoughts on space or astronomy for us to read out, or you want to control the Q&A agenda with your favourite topic, just drop us a line at the show at awesomeastronomy.com or tweet us at awesomeastropod. So until next time, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod.com or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission. <laughs>